This is OD Online. Come get high with us. Hey everybody, it's Dan O'Donnell here. Welcome to OD on Life, episode number nine. Today I have Tim Bako from Bringers.co with me. He's in Chiang Mai for a few weeks, so I wanted to catch him while he's in town, and he'll be heading back to Singapore soon. Uh, before I forget to tell you, you can check us out on iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube, and we appreciate you subscribing and rating at any of those um, places, and you can consume us however you want. I recommend Stitcher, actually. I'm pretty hooked on that. Um, and I know a lot of you are on YouTube as well. Feel free to share with your friends as well. Also, um, our goal each episode is to give you something, a gem, a nugget that you can actually apply to your life. So we try to be entertaining and fun to listen to, but the real goal is that you walk away with something that you can use. So we'll try to do that again for you here today. So Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. So you've been in Chiang Mai how long now? Uh, about two weeks so okay. far. Yeah. And you're right in the middle of starting up bringers. It's going, right? Yeah, yeah. We just started working on it uh, back in November, so it's ready the first few months. Yeah, and I yeah. have seen I've seen some of your updates. People are bringing stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. We've had our first deliveries happening about a few weeks ago. Uh, so now we've brought stuff in Bali, Thailand, uh, some in Germany as well. And we have uh, Philippines just yesterday. We have a few planned uh, in the coming days cool. as well. Congratulations. Thanks. So for people that don't know what bringers.co is, can you give us the elevator pitch? Yeah, basically we're a marketplace where if you're living abroad, you can request an item and have a traveler who's headed your way deliver it to you. Uh, so for a lot of expats around the world, travelers, it's really hard to get stuff from home, uh, whether it's just stuff from Amazon, some food, some sports gear, spare parts for your yep. computer. Um, so things like that, you basically put up a request, say how much you'd like to pay someone for, to deliver it to you, and uh, we'll match you with a flyer who can bring your item. That's cool. You know, right before I first heard about your company, I did basically exactly what you're doing, but I had to set it up myself. Yeah. And so I think you're going to take a lot of that, that hassle out of doing the exact... I know people are already doing this. Yeah, well, um, all our team are like frequent travelers. Yeah. So my, co- my co-founders and I, we've all lived across the world uh, and we've all done this as well. So it, that was kind of the inception of it where we wanted to create something that would solve our own problem. And when we learned that like other people were sharing the same issue, uh, that's when we figured out we were onto something, yeah. Right. So what had what had you needed in the past or your friends? Um, I, I don't think... like I never Never, I never went to the the point where I actually got something. I was just like, oh, I'll wait till I get home. But oh, yeah. what I used to do is just order loads of stuff uh, and get shipped to my parents' house. Yep. So last year I was gone for six months. I was like, every time you're online on Amazon, I was just like, oh, okay, get this shipped. And then you just get home six months later with this big pile of stuff that uh, would have yeah. been super useful three months ago. Yep. Uh, so I know yeah. people that do the same thing. They wait, you know, <laughs> oh, I'm going home in six months. Yeah. <laughs> and then they have, like mine, the one that I wanted, I'm, I'm pretty... I'm kind of a minimalist and I'm not that picky about brands and stuff with most things, but I try to live pretty healthy and I try to avoid aluminum in deodorant. Okay. And so I wanted Tom's of Maine, which is a brand that's all over in the U.S., probably in Canada too, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, I just couldn't find it anywhere here. And I looked on Amazon and they will ship here, but I was, I was looking at a six pack, which is about $25 and to ship it over here to Thailand, it was going to be $50 U.S. Yeah. Know? Yeah. That's a really big one. Actually, like... Same thing, we're, we're all travelers in our team and we don't have a lot of stuff, mm-hmm. but it's like since you only own like, I don't know, 50 items in your life, you kind of want them to work. Yeah. Uh, so like I, I won't mind paying a bit more for like one thing I want because it's not like I'm buying stuff every day, I buy stuff every month or every few months. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, and you know, sometimes I've had it both ways where you go to a country and you bring more than you need because you didn't realize how accessible certain things yeah. are. Um, like toiletries and stuff yeah. like that. I remember the first few times I traveled, I just, you know, got to have an extra tube of toothpaste just yeah. in case. Like they don't have toothpaste in Asia, yeah. right? And uh, But then it's the other way around sometimes where you think, oh, they'll have that. And then you find out there's certain things just don't exist there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So what are people, you've had the Philippines, Thailand, Bali, what are they bringing so far? Um, Philippines was uh, just a book, like foreign lang- language book is a big one. Okay. Um, uh, we had a really cool one from Germany too, which was someone who just wanted chocolate from anywhere across the world. So just yeah. like bring me some random chocolate from a country and a girl from Romania brought it over to him. Cool. Uh, this week we're doing one in Cambodia where someone wants to give the tiny, tiny box set to their kids. Uh, so a big books box set that okay. they only ship in the UK. So we're bringing that to the UK. Um, loads of Amazon, so like Kindles, books, uh, things like that. Spare parts for computers, for bikes. 
um, really just the kind of stuff that like it's a bit specific so you can't just right. find it in the store uh, or like brand stuff like uh, we had a girl today requesting a dress just like that specific brand dress from from France so uh, obviously they don't sell that in Bangkok right. uh, so yeah either yeah. about I was just not to interrupt but about half of the things you just said you're spurring my memory I've brought those things to my dad he lives in Costa Rica books bike parts it's always a bike part you yeah. know, he, he rides every day and something's breaking or wearing out or it'll be for his friend's bike yeah, yeah. I brought him you know what do you call it the thing that tells you how far you've gone odometer yeah, this, yeah. Yeah. Um, all sorts of that stuff and he just even if he was willing to drive to the capital city in Costa Rica, you just can't find it. Yeah, you can't find it. Or like sometimes, what I found is sometimes you'll find an alternative that's more expensive and not as good. Yeah. So it's like you're paying twice the price and it's not even the thing yeah. you like. And, and you know, not to, I'm not going to get you in trouble and I'm sure, of course, you would never do this. But there are some things that have huge import duties too. Uh, yeah, that's something we can't really like help out with. Like we right. get a lot of requests for iPhones in Brazil because iPhones have like 100% beauty yeah. in Brazil. Um, what we basically tell people is like, yeah, your traveler will probably pay the duty. Um, yeah. And so you'll have to. Um, so like as much as we don't like that there's so much duty, it's just not something we, uh, we focus on. Yeah. It's more about like the things, like and the thing is you can get an iPhone in Brazil, it's just more expensive. Right. Uh, so it's more about the things you just can't get and that'll kind of keep you on traveling and make living abroad a bit, uh, a bit easier. Right. Yeah. And so how long have you been out of Canada at this point? Um, I've... I spent six months last year. I went back for six months this summer. I was okay. supposed to sign up for business school and uh, learn a bunch of stuff there. Uh, but then my co-founder and I, we'd had a business together in the past. Uh, we'd both traveled a lot and we decided to, to start something new again. So to kind of take another another leap. So we left back in the uh, end of September. And, okay. Yeah. And was that, you left from Montreal? Or yeah. Where were you? Okay. Then that's where you grew up? Uh, yeah, I grew up in Montreal. Okay. And so I, I was doing a little bit of homework on you and that seemed like a a really interesting time in your life so you went back and you were more or less back in the grind yeah it was that was pretty crazy i spent six months just backpacking across southeast asia so uh like going meditating working on farms things like that and then i got back to montreal to running a business again uh kind of like within a week so it was from like six months of not working to working 60 80 hours a week uh the whole summer basically so that was a bit of a, a shock coming back. And what sort of work? What were you doing? Um, we had a company in Montreal, my co-founder Catherine and I, where we'd hire students to paint people's homes in the summer. Okay. Uh, so basically it was pretty cool because it gave stu like college student jobs in the summer. Yeah. And it was much cheaper for customers because they wouldn't pay contractors. They'd pay students to paint their homes or their deck or whatever. Uh, so we'd been doing that for three years. And then after three years, uh, we decided we wanted to do something a bit different. Uh, we both really liked traveling. We liked. Uh, we were more interested in technology, so we wanted something more along those lines. Um, so we went to Bali. We went to visit some startups in New York, San Francisco before as well uh, to kind of get an idea of what our next thing would be. And then in Bali, we uh, we thought of Brainers and got started on that. Yeah. And so you started that about three years ago right now? Yeah. The painting company? Yeah. And how old were you? Because you're a young guy, right? Uh, yeah, I'm 20 right now. My co-founder turned 21 uh, two days ago. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I started that. We were 17. I was the youngest in the business at that time. Uh, before that, we had also a small t-shirt business. We were really into music, so I sold t-shirts at concerts and stuff like that uh, when I was 16. So I've kind of always been doing these, uh, these projects. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, when you were 17 running that company, were you in high school or college? Or? Um, in, in Canada, we have kind of the in-between called CJEP. Okay. Uh, so it's like you're, you finish high school when you're 16 and you start uni when you're 18. And you have two years... Um, it's a good uh, analogy. It's kind of like everyone has to go to a bad community college okay. for two years before they go to university. Um, so I started it in that CJP part. And so uh, the reason I ask is I was wondering if you were still in high school but hiring college students. But was it sort of like that? Uh, it was more like we were in college hiring some of our painters uh, for like bigger jobs were actually like real painters. Okay. So uh, yeah, I was the youngest in my company for sure. Um, so I'd hire like 20 to 25 years old uh, yeah. mostly and then we'd have like two or three 40 to 50 year old guy also working with us uh, so the first year we had I think 10 or 12 painters and on the third year we had like uh, around 20 okay. so we had a pretty good team yeah and so what was that like for you being 20 and hiring people you know decades some of them older than, than you, you you just learned so much I mean and that I guess that's kind of 
what we realized after doing three years of that is the amount you would learn in a week of doing that was equivalent to what you learned in a year at school. Uh, so like you'd hire, you'd have customers, obviously you have some unhappy customers, yeah. uh, you have some unhappy employees, you have to deal with it, you still have to keep up, like it was a franchise system, so there were a hundred of us who were or painting franchise in different places so you have the competition that kicks in and uh, you have to keep up with the numbers uh, so it kind of feels like you're managing all these things while you're in school uh, I don't know 40 hours a week or yeah, something really. uh, so yeah it was pretty uh, pretty challenging yeah I had a friend who did a similar thing I don't I don't think he was in a franchise I think he was independent but I remember you know it's a college friend and he was already busy with school and that on top yeah. of it. it was pretty hectic for him but yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually finished my last year of school uh, just online uh, because just the fact that being like constrained to go to school from this to this hour was just too hard. So I'd rather like I'd set up my own schedule and get all my stuff done in the morning and then I could work the rest of the day. Yeah. So yeah, it's really like managing your time a lot. So, and I'm sorry, what was the name of that two-year school again? Um, CIGEP. And so is that what you finished? Is that what you meant? Yeah, that's what okay. I finished. So I never started uni. Okay. Uh, like proper university and was that because you were just eager to get going on business or well I like after two years I took six months to travel across Asia and then I signed back up and uh, I don't know I just felt like starting another project would be a kind of a big yeah. experience right. so uh, I canceled I canceled and um, I actually I, I was signed up for business school but uh, since we were starting a tech company I wanted to learn to code so I started teaching myself how to program uh, right now I'm taking some online classes with that as well so I still kind of wanted to like learn some new things yeah. uh, not just run another company with no new knowledge but um, definitely more at my pace and like stuff that was directly relevant to what we're doing right I felt the same I went to a, a year and a half of college after okay. high school and I just didn't feel like it really was teaching me what I wanted to learn yeah. you know I mean I actually really enjoy learning even if it's stuff that I might never apply you know documentaries yeah, and yeah. things like that <clears throat> but if I'm if I'm trying to move forward and actually learn a trade or a business, yeah. I don't want to take English classes and all this stuff. So and just like being location independent too, like I mean I've been teaching myself to code through Bali, Singapore, and now Thailand. Like whereas if you're in business school in Montreal, you're in Montreal. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's been really cool as well. And you know it sounds like you know if you're in a business school, a lot of times they'll bring in people like you <laughs> or the people that you met in New York yeah. and Singapore. They'll bring them in to speak to the class, and you might get to ask a couple <laughs> questions. But you just went and found these guys. Yeah, right? yeah, that was pretty crazy. Like, and it's once you actually once you actually like start looking to to meet people to like get to know like. For us, it was startups, but whatever, like a community like that, you find out like there are events, there are like meetups and things like that. And we went to New York for like two weeks. We got to see the Kickstarter offices, all kinds of other startups, uh, meet other founders, and really you get an inside view of okay, what's your day to day like? Yeah. Uh, and that that would that just kind of set the bar for us. Like, okay, this is what Kickstarter does. So, right. like, this is what we hope or like would like to achieve in five years, and to kind of be able to talk with the people and go, okay, how did you get there? And, uh, to get that information is just the yeah the most important. That's thing. so key. Yeah. Having role models at whatever yeah. it is you want to do. You yeah. Know? I mean, if it's sports, getting around people that are better than you, getting on a team. Yeah. 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 And so uh, yeah, that's great that you really you went out and took the reins and did that. Yeah. Were Were there any point you know when you're getting ready to possibly drop your business school or you're going to New York to these big yeah. offices and stuff? I mean, were you nervous? Yeah, you're always nervous. Yeah. Um. I had one guy on the show just say, I said, I was asking him about getting outside his comfort zone, and he said, I, I, I just don't really have a comfort zone. Yeah. That was the only guy I've ever met that says no, that. I, I, no, we felt it every time, and yeah. I think my, my co-founder and I, we've worked on a lot of projects together, and like our skills are really complementary, so in parts where like I'll, I would have bailed out that she's pretty strong and vice versa, uh -huh. uh, so that's really helped, but like, yeah, deciding not to go to school and to go back to Asia after six months there was kind of like okay is this really going to be worth it and then uh, when even when we were in New York we were like what the hell are we doing and uh, we had our tickets to Bali we cancelled them and then two days later we booked back on the same flight uh, we're like okay fuck it we're going to go to Bali yeah. um, and then even when we got to Bali like we just uh, raised an investment with uh, an incubator JFDI uh, but we still spent four months in Bali like not knowing if anyone would ever pay us to do this or like if like what were we going to do once we ran out of money yeah. um so yeah so far it's been like a lot of outside your comfort zone moments yeah for sure so yeah it's i know a lot of people they look at 
big companies like the Kickstarters and, and people like that, and and it just looks like it was easy all the way because the only the only time you start hearing about them is once they're successful, yeah, right? Course. And I think it's I talk about this every episode, but if you look into you know you find your heroes, Kickstarter, whatever, Babe Ruth, Mickey yeah. Mantle, and you look at the road that it took them to get there and how many times they failed. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's it's not that 30-second snippet on the news. <laughs> you know, you read the biography, you'll hear all about, like, do you know who Mickey Mantle is? I know baseball's uh, not huge in Canada. The, the name is familiar. He's a Hall of Fame yeah, baseball okay. player, like one of the best of all time. Mm -hmm. And there was a point where he was ready to quit baseball. And his dad, I don't remember all the details, but I, I don't think his, he even knew his dad was coming. His dad showed up with his luggage. And, and his dad was a coal miner that probably was close to as talented as his son, but never got to play baseball full time, you know, professionally because yeah. he had to put food on the table. And he just came with his, his luggage. He's like, hey, you know, you're in or out right now. You know, are you going to go with this or are you going to come home and be a coal miner like me for the rest of your life? Yeah. You know, and he just kind of gave him a little brow beating. And that was the like the choose your own adventure book. You know, yeah. Mickey Mantle could have been a coal miner. And wow. now he's, you know, like my dad's generation, he was the guy. Wow. You know, he was the guy. My dad lived in New York, and he was everybody's hero. And even kids across the nation were Yankees fans, and Mickey Mantle was, was it. Wow, yeah, you that's know? pretty cool. Mickey Mantle, almost a coal miner. <laughs> you yeah. know, and there's probably who knows how many guys like him that did go back to the coal mines. Yeah, for sure. Right? So, um, yeah, I think somebody out there probably is listening, and they're at that point, and they have the doubts, and they're wondering, you know, am I crazy? But... Uh, you know, look into what other people have done. Yeah, and know. there's one. Uh, there's there's an essay from uh, Paul Graham. He's he has he owns the biggest uh, incubator in San Francisco, Y Combinator, yeah. and he writes all these essays about startups and uh, like raising money and like how to succeed. And they're they're really really good. And there's one that's called uh, How Not to Die. And that's what he talks about. He says most startups that get successful just do not die. Um, and that. Like this, as long as you're not quitting, you're packing your bags and going back to the coal mine. Even if you just don't stop, and like, yeah, things get hard sometimes, yeah. things like that. Um, to just not give up and not die. Uh, like in Bali, when it was really hard, that was kind of our motto. Like, just not go back to Montreal. Yeah. Like, as long as we did go back to Montreal, we didn't die, and right. we were able to keep keep on pushing forward. Um, so yeah, that that's been like our. From the beginning, just don't die. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's worked so far. You know, Elon Musk, right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody talks about what a genius he is. Yeah. And, you know, he's just got this Midas touch and everything. I don't remember every detail about it, but there was a point where I believe he was unable to make payroll, I think was the issue. And he put all his cash on the yeah. line. And he, yeah, he, he actually, like, he became a billionaire and then he actually uh, put all his, yeah, 100% yeah. of his net worth on the line and was renting a place to live, actually. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, Shoot, I mean, I wonder how many uh, even other billionaires would have recommended he do that. I mean, he went all yeah. in, right? Yeah, I exactly. Mean, yeah. So, and there might, again, there could be a couple guys just like him where it didn't work out. Yeah. We don't know who they are, but, um, <laughs> yeah, so it's not just all, you know, you don't take the escalator to no. success. you got to take the stairs, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, wow. Man, I had another good example popping in my head, and then it just went away. Um, so, real quick, I have to ask you, too, like, you've got, a, your tattoo says something about pirates, Yeah. And you have a big, like, pirate beard, right? I just, <laughs> yeah. I got to ask you about that. Switch gears um, for a second. Yeah, the, the beard, um, like, we had the painting company, so I did sales for three years, kind yeah. of like the middle class uh, family uh -huh. selling them their painting contracts. Uh, so obviously I could grow a beard, but right. I went traveling to Asia for six months and I just stopped shaving. Yeah. Um, and then I never got a real job again, uh, so I, I kept it. Yeah. It's almost like a symbol of freedom, huh? Yeah, right. And I just, yeah, I enjoyed growing it. Yeah. Cool. I remember I have a much smaller beard, but um, I remember when I was watching some documentary about these guys who were um, reenacting a voyage by some great English explorer in Africa. They were basically walking across Africa, and uh, I was kind of hooked on the show on National Geographic or something. And there was this guy, he looked like he just used hair clippers to trim his beard, you know? And I was getting sick of shaving, but I was in a sales job too. I was a real estate agent. And I was like, you know... I might be able to get away with that <laughs> that sort of beard thing yeah. where it looks like, you know, if you just haven't shaved in like three or four days, yeah. it looks like you just don't care. Yeah. But once it's a little bit past there, then it's like a clean cut beard, yeah. right? Like you, you're trying to have a beard, but you're also grooming it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, anyway. Um, so, 
Uh, boy, I have a whole list of things to talk to you about. Oh, your co-founder. How did you guys meet? You, you started businesses when you were real young? Oh, yeah. We're friends since high school, like since we've been 13 years old. Yeah. Um, and, like, we were the first two people to have businesses in high school, so we kind of got to know each other. And then uh, in CJEP, we did that other project together, um, and we traveled together. Uh, like I was telling you earlier before the podcast, I went to Victoria for a summer. We went on a summer exchange together, so we've just kind of always been uh, working with each other's projects, and uh, yeah. Bringers is one of them. Are your parents entrepreneurial too, or did they uh, support you in it? How my, was that? Like, my mom's a doctor, um, so not like she doesn't have her own business or anything. My, both my parents support me. They're really cool about it. Uh, my dad used to have a like an MBA sales jobs in a big company and uh, didn't really like it, so he just started. Uh, he was really into renovation and building homes. It's like he renovated our college, renovated our home. Um, and then, yeah, this, he was getting sick of the sales jobs. We just decided to quit it and start building homes. So it's kind of entrepreneurial, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, like no, no big business owner or whatever in, right. in my family, yeah. But So yeah, okay, cool. You just, it sounds like you, you just had the bug since a young age, though. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Um, did you sell things when you were a little kid too? I'm mean, talking like you know, eight, nine years old, where you're like selling your Halloween candy. I, or I really anything? don't like sales. Okay. Uh, no, so I've never like I've never really like even in, in the franchise selling painting contracts. I was so bad. Like I would get so many quotes, so I would still be good, but like my my sales rate wasn't so good. Um, no, I I really enjoyed the part where you're just kind of doing things for the first time, yeah. uh, something you've never done before. Like I had it when I had a t-shirt company, we'd set up like these photo shoots, and I'd never done a photo shoot in my life before. So it's like. You ask people like, "Oh, can you take pictures? Can you be a model for my, my clothing company?" And we're gonna go somewhere and take pictures. And you're just like figuring all this stuff as you go. Yeah. Uh, so that's really the aspect I like of it. And Brinier's has a lot of that, obviously, with uh, like international delivery, right. uh, matching people together. So it's really interesting. Uh, and like, it's not something that exists right now that we're replicating. So it's really interesting to just be like building this thing that no one else is really doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's no other way to do it other than just figure it out as you go, right? You make your best guess and then yeah, make adjustments. Then, yeah, you make mistakes, you make adjustments, and like obviously you try and like learn from the best people. I, yeah. Like we're in an incubator now, so hopefully they can just a thing or two, uh, and just like hire people that are really good at what they do. And uh, like we just have a a third co-founder that joined last week. Uh, it's more of a like engineering oriented guy, and he's just really good at what he does as well. So it's kind of like. If everyone's good at what they do and we're confident, like we're all in in this, uh, then yeah, hopefully it turns out well and we were able to adjust. Did that third co-founder come through your incubator? Uh, no, actually oh. it came through just like a job listing. Um, yeah, so we found him. He was from New York originally, wanted to move to Asia to work on like a different type of project. Um, and yeah. So you all meet up in Singapore soon? Uh, yeah, well, he's with us in Chiang Mai now, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, he flew to Chiang Mai. Nice. Yeah. And so I'm sure there will be some people listening to this that are following your progress. And Can you tell us a little more about how you first got involved with the incubator? Did you seek them? They heard about you? Um, yeah, the incubator is called the JFDI. They have a program online called Discover. Where basically, I think it's like it's 100 Singapore dollars. And for a month, they'll just follow your, follow your startup. And then every week, you'll talk with them and like follow your metrics and kind of tell you, depending on which stage you're at, whether it's just an idea or whether you've already got something built, like how do you validate that from now? Like, how do you make sure it's actually something people want and you're not just building something that mm -hmm. no one's going to care about? Uh, so that was super helpful for us. We did that for three weeks in December with us, uh, with them. And then we obviously got to know them through the calls and everything. They, if you're in Singapore, they actually have open houses every Friday. So you can just go there and, like, talk to the people about your idea. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, from there, they have another program called Accelerate, which is more they'll fund you, they'll give you a bit of money, and for three months, they'll mentor you. And then at the end, you get to pitch some bigger investors. Um, so we really just kind of went through the funnel. So we did Discover, uh, like every week we'd talk with them, like, oh, okay, we shouldn't do this, should do that, and just like hit our numbers every week. And then, um, yeah, we, we applied for, for the next phase. And same thing, they kind of watched what we were doing uh, to see if we were really serious about it. And then after a few, a uh, few weeks of talking with them, then uh, yeah, we're part of their next batch now. Yeah, that's a great deal. Yeah. I mean, a hundred dollars <laughs> per month, right? So it's twenty five dollars a meeting, basically. Is that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, and, and uh, just uh, like some, we've applied this other incubators as well, and it's just you're sending like a blank application with a one minute video or something about yourself. Right. Uh, so it's much harder to kind of convey what you're good at, and unless you have like maybe like you've worked at Google or like you. 
like you've built another startup before that you can just quote, um, it's kind of hard to show on your application, like we're really gonna work hard and make this work. Uh, so JFDI were super open to just watching you over a long period of time. And yeah. like, if you do the work, then obviously fund you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like an interview process, more or less. They yeah, like a few months around. of interview. Yeah. yeah. I was going to ask you, too. I came across somewhere, um, you were talking about obligations, priorities, freeing up your time for yeah. focusing on what you really want to do, which we kind of already talked about with dropping classes and yeah. things like that. But do you do that in other areas of your life as well? I mean, do you minimize obligations? Um, I don't have a phone anymore. That was a really big one. Oh, yeah. um, I guess the thing is... Like right now, we don't have many exterior obligations at this point. So it's more like like we're working on bringers. Um, we've secured some funding for the next few months. It's more like what's the most important thing about bringers to do. And one thing I think we did really well with bringers is to just my co-founder and I go to the other end of the world where we had no friends, we didn't know mm -hmm. any, we didn't know anyone. And so basically all we have is bringers. Like it's not like yeah. you have your friends to go out on Friday nights. If you have friends and you met them working on bringers and then they'll ask you how bringers is going. Right. Um, so that's been really, really uh, good. Like t towards like just maximizing your, your working on your project every day and it's the only thing you do. Um, so that was a big one to cut out. Um, and yeah, not having your phone, uh, less interruptions, I guess. Right, yeah. yeah. Do you have a Google Voice number or something along? Is there any place somebody can leave you a voicemail even? Not a voicemail. Okay. Uh, I have like a text number. There was this app yeah. called Text Plus that gives you a random US phone number. Uh -huh. um, it it kind of stops working sometimes. Like I'll text my mom and my dad with that. Uh, if not, just like I use email. Yeah. Um, but like I really love email because you can just manage. Even if you have 100, you can just go through whenever it's convenient. Yeah. yeah. You can have one time every day you do yeah. it or check it when you're waiting for a bus. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I feel the same. Phone calls are great when something important actually needs to get solved yeah. but you, you know over here yeah. a lot of us use Skype or Google yeah. Hangouts for that or whatever but just being accessible all the time by something that rings oh, in yeah, your pocket it's yeah it's it's not very productive yeah, yeah. Um, I before I came over here I was never really big on talking on the phone okay. and so I remember I used to have a flea market and I would be standing at the counter talking to a customer about whatever mm -hmm. you know they'd be looking at some jewelry or something and my phone would be in my pocket and would ring. And I always had it set really low, the volume. Um, but they would hear it, you know, just enough. And they go, oh, you can go ahead and take that. Yeah. I'm like, no, I can't. <laughs> you know, I'm standing here talking to you. Yeah. I don't even know who that is. You know, yeah. I'm not just going to interrupt my day at random intervals. Oh, no, it's crazy. Like, when we had the painting business, we obviously needed a phone. And I'd average, like, three to 5,000 minutes a month, which is, yeah. like, 5,000 is almost 200 minutes a day. It's, so like, three over three hours a day mm -hmm. um, of just, like, these interruptions and these... Like, and most of it's not really useful uh, to your day. Like one, maybe ten percent of it is actually worth dealing with. But the ninety percent, you can just cut it out. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's great. Even you know, and you can train people that. I mean, one thing you can do is just not pick it up as much. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. And they'll spit out in a ten-second voicemail what might have been a five or ten-minute conversation. Oh, yeah. you know? oh no, we had that all the time with painters. They call me like, "Oh my God, Tim! Like, you really need to call me back. Uh, yeah. Like, this is super important." And then I went to answer, and three minutes later, like, oh, okay, it's fine. We'll we figure figured it out. out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we found it. Yeah, yeah. right. So, um, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. And I think if the expectations there, people won't get too upset if they just kind of know you're not yeah. a big phone person. <laughs> and if you do still have a phone, just tell them, text me, you know. Yeah, that's no sure. big deal. But that's what voicemail is for. There yeah. was a day when voicemail didn't exist, you know, and it was just the phone was <laughs> ringing on the wall. And, man, if I don't pick that up, you know, what if it's something really important? Yeah. I'll, I'll never know who it was. I mean, I remember those days. <laughs> and uh, I remember when caller ID was new, which you probably don't. I'm guessing no. you don't remember that. <laughs> caller ID, you get this magic box and hook it up to your phone, and uh, you can see the number, and it was like, I, I, you feel like 007 or something, you know? And then there was star 69 and star yeah, 67 yeah. and stuff like that, you know? Yeah, it was crazy. But uh, luckily, we're a lot, I mean, I, I still feel like when I watch, you know, you look at the old Star Trek episodes, and you see the little communicator things they have. It looks like a flip phone. Yeah. You know, what we have now is literally beyond what they imagined on Star Trek. You know, yeah. you've got Skype and all this stuff when you but, need uh, it. But it's really important to not let it take over your life. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, it's like, have you ever read um, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey? Not, not that one, actually. It's a great yeah. one. He's yeah. got his quadrants. You know, quadrant one is urgent and oh, yeah. important. yeah, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so some things are urgent and important, not a whole lot usually. And then the one that's most overlooked is important but not urgent. Yeah, for sure. And the one that usually gets in the way of that quadrant is urgent but not important, which yeah. is phone calls. They're yeah. a perfect example. 
Yeah. yeah. Now, when we had the painting business, we'd use that a lot. Like I, every like summer, I'd give a talk to my employees about that. Like, yeah, if it's urgent, important, you call me. If it's urgent, not important, you figure it out. And like, yeah, that's that's a really big game changer. Yeah, and um, I think you'd like that book. Um, and you know, there's if you're into audio, like I yeah. am too, it's all over the place. I mean, probably even YouTube has it. And anybody listening. It's, it's a short and sweet, like really powerful book by Stephen Covey. It's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, it's just a great framework for just yeah. being effective, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he gives a lot of examples that are similar to phone calls that people just tend to get caught up in. Mm-hmm. I mean, people just drop obligations on you, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, um, you know, getting good at saying no in a nice way is a really important skill. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... What have you learned over the last, you know, over this process of starting up a business? What surprised you? What, I mean, uh, um, how hard it was was yeah. a big surprise. But I, I mean, you kind of expect things to be hard, but as soon as they're harder than the hardest thing you've done, then you kind of don't know like how hard that was going to be. Huh. Um, and like we, we used to have a franchise, which was like they gave us a, a, a model that worked, and it was basically how fast can you spin the wheel to generate yeah, sales right, and make right. money with that model. Uh, whereas now, it's what will be your model and how can you figure that out. Um, so that was like, and and we've just learned so much doing that, like talking with users and uh, both bringers and requesters about what they actually want, how they want us to build it, what's actually their problem, and to to kind of focus on solving their problem and not doing the thing you think will solve your problem is a subtle but really big one uh, that we've learned in the past few months. Um, So for example, at first, uh, when we started, we figured, okay, you need to build this big fancy website to like like Airbnb basically, but for for items and stuff like that. Uh, So, okay, how do you build this website? And then you spend your whole day thinking, okay, how do you build the website? Uh, But the actual problem you wanna solve is how do you get person A is the item from person B. Um, and that, that actually took us probably a month to kind of be like, okay, okay, like we're going too far in this and let's just like make deliveries happen. Right. You, and, you could open up a Google spreadsheet yeah, and get and, them going. Yeah, right? that's, that's what we do. We're using <laughs> Typeform now and, yeah. uh, and Google spreadsheets and like manually matching people and it works. Like we yep. have deliveries going and we've gathered like a hundred times more data doing that than yeah. trying to build the thing we thought would work. Right. And now like we're obviously we're working on an application but now we have actual transactions yeah. and we know like what are the problems in them where can you like where do you need to uh, improve things and things like yeah. that um, and now you don't have to build a big fancy website yeah, twice right exactly <laughs> um, so just like figuring out what is the actual problem you want, you want to solve um, and like a lot of investors talk about that uh, like the risk associated with your idea is like an onion so you basically if you want an investor to invest in you uh, it's basically peeling every layer of the onion and each layer being a, a risk you face so like what's the like most riskiest assumption about your idea right now so ours was like is it possible to get people from a to b to deliver an item for like a 10 20 dollar commission um but then like to keep that as your focus and not your oh we need to build a web app or oh we need to find funding or we need to like yep. get a programmer or whatever um yeah that was a really big learning and all that stuff it's like the cart before the horse because yeah. if you have deliveries happening that programmer you're talking to is going to be more excited yeah. about working with you and the, the guy with the money is going to be more willing to talk it's, about giving them the money. yeah exactly and that's that's a really hard process and it's her first uh, first time fundraising too so you realize how distracting that is yeah um like like you, we would spend 25 to 50 percent of our time thinking about fundraising and not just building your your product. Yeah. Uh, so to just be able to like figure out, okay, what's the number one problem for today? Just solve that problem. Uh, if you go like that, uh, it's probably the simplest but yeah. most effective way. You know, I saw you have a post in the, our Facebook group, the Chiang Mai Digital yeah. Nomads. If you want to come to Chiang Mai, join that group. It's got tons really of information. Good. Really, yeah, really good. It, yeah. Uh, if you're even thinking about traveling to this area, it's a great place to get in and start learning. Um, but you've got a post in there about bringers, and it's it's had a bunch of, I don't know if you've seen all the comments, but yeah. a lot of people are talking on that post, which is cool. Um, and I noticed one of the questions, people were, a couple of the people were kind of stuck on like, well, how much is it going to cost me? How much am I going to make if I'm a bringer? Da, 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 yeah. da. And I think it was your co-founder who sort of responded I don't remember the exact words, but the idea was, you know, most people doing this, they're not really doing it for the money primarily. Yeah. And and it reminded me of couch surfing. Yeah, exactly. If if like 20 years ago you would have told people that, hey, I'm going to make this website where people say that you can sleep at my house for free. Mm-hmm. 
It's like, yeah. wait, yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. That's your, that's your idea. <laughs> wait, yeah. you were forgetting something. Like, why would somebody open their door to a stranger and let them sleep there for free? You know, but it happens all the time. Yeah, I've used it on both sides. I've let people stay with me. I've stayed with other people, um, and so yeah, I think. People like to help, you know, it yeah. makes you feel good. And I think, like, we, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about the business model. Like, do you go all free? Do you, like, charge some money? Do you charge a lot of money? And what, like, what the people have told us is, like, a bit of money is nice because you're obviously kind of being inconvenienced. Like, you have to go to the store and buy something. Yeah. Um, so to just kind of feel like, like your time is worth something. You know, the requester side too, uh, requesters usually feel less bad. Like I'll give you 10 bucks to go buy my book. Whereas just asking for a stranger right. to go buy your book, if for some reason it takes like two stores get instead of one, you yeah. feel like like your good karma has been expired already. Right. Uh, so we just like found like a little bit of money uh, will kind of make the transaction more of a transaction. Yeah. But then the main motivation is like, yeah, bring yours, our travelers too. They can imagine being at the other end of the world yeah. and needing that one thing. Um, so they're, they're happy to help. And that's, that's been really, really cool to, to see that. Yeah. And you're going to meet like-minded people. Yeah. I could see friendships happening. For sure. This. Like you get at your destination, you land at the airport and then uh, you meet someone and you give them the item. And yeah. obviously like people are free to choose whatever items they want. So you're bringing something you kind of know something about. Yeah. Uh, obviously if I'm a guy, I'm probably not going to be in makeup. I might bring you some sports shoes. Uh, so if like we both do CrossFit or we both yeah, play right. tennis, I bring right. you a tennis racket. Um, then you kind of have this like, yeah. this mutual interest. And uh, if they meet you cool. at the airport, you might get a ride from the airport. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like figure it's out cool. where to, to book your hotel and yeah. not get screwed and things like that. So yeah. Definitely. Uh, Has that happened or do you know? You might not hear all the stories, you know. But, um, but. Like we haven't, yeah, I try Is, to talk with the people after. We haven't had stories uh, or people telling me about yeah. big stories like that. But like we've had people being really helpful. Like uh, one guy's tools, the, the bringer had to go to three different stores. They kind of emailed each other back and forth to make sure it was the right thing. Okay. Uh, and then the bringer, uh, the requester, sorry, went to meet him directly at his home. Uh, so that was like the guy really, really went out of his way to get the item. Another one, like the chocolate I was telling you earlier in Germany, um, the guy gave just a one dollar commission. It was like wherever you're from, just surprise me with your chocolate. <laughs> so uh, Mihaela, who brought the chocolate over, uh, was just really nice and kind of grabbing something and meeting him in in Munich to, to get yeah. to him. Yeah, you know that almost makes me want to just go put up a couple things just to meet people. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, now you have me thinking, like what would be something that interesting people would want to bring? Oh, yeah. And we, you know. Yeah, and we're starting to get like we're starting to get people from uh, the Western world actually asking for stuff too. Like we had a girl oh. in New York asking for camel socks from Mongolia, oh. or someone else asking just like for some candies from Japan. Um, so to kind of put some traveling back in their life back home. Wow. Yeah. I can see someday importers and exporters are going to be looking at the request to figure out what's not <laughs> where are the niches that aren't yeah. being met, right? Yeah. Man, that's now you've really got me thinking. I want to just request random things from like <laughs> that you could only find in maybe Washington State. I can yeah. meet people from like my home area. Yeah. What's really funny yeah. is we actually got a guy from uh, Oregon who requested a bottle of Samsung, like the, the, the ten dollar whiskey yeah, for right, beer. Right. Uh, that was just so funny to see that. Like, that it's is not funny. pretty good. No, but I guess just like the emotional thing of like the the Thailand drink. Right. Uh, yeah. So in the middle of the U.S., someone requesting that right now. Yeah, it sounds like he almost must be having a theme party or something. <laughs> he's, he's throwing a Thailand party and has to have that. Or, yeah, that's funny. The only reason you really buy that is because the imported stuff costs twice as much. Yeah, exactly. You know? um, yeah. Anything that's made in Thailand is yeah. cheaper. That's basically how it works here. You know, even if it's the same quality. Yeah. Like the you know if you buy the Thai beer, it's. You know, 60 yeah. baht, if you buy the Heineken, it's 100. Yeah. Um, huh. <laughs> Man. So, yeah, if you're out there, everybody, go check out this site. It's it's really a cool idea. Um, and it's funny because I've had people ask me this when I had my flea market. They'd say, how did you come up with that idea? I'm like, you know, it's you can't even really call it an idea. Yeah. There just wasn't one in Bellingham, where <laughs> I was from, you know. And, like, people have been doing this, and you had been doing this, and it's just nobody was – I mean, what you're doing is – you're, you found a way to help people. Yeah. You know, this is a problem that a lot of people have. How can we get in the middle and make it easier, right? Yeah, exactly. And, like, the, I think one of the short-term goals we're hoping bringers will solve is you have a lot of people who, say, live in the States, Canada, wherever, and they look as, like, moving to Bali as this big, crazy thing. Like, I'm going to go live in the jungle in the middle of monkeys. And like you said earlier, like, there's not going to be toothpaste in Asia. Yeah. Um, so if we're able to, like, get the service big enough so that people from 
back home or like from countries such as Europe, Canada, whatever, um, you kind of think like, oh, it's not too bad. If I go travel to Asia, if these Brinjers is there and if I'm missing like some yeah. maple syrup or whatever, my makeup, uh, I'll just get a Brinjer. Yeah. And to kind of get like that, uh, that mentality that living across like anywhere, just like living anywhere, you can get stuff and you're not totally disconnected. Um, it's really something we're hoping to achieve where- Kind of reassuring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. reassuring, yeah. Man, that's, yeah. that's interesting. Huh. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go post something on there after we're done. I'm not sure what yet. <laughs> um, now, have are you using it for anything, or will you, or what? what? Um, I'm actually. Uh, I'm going back to Montreal next uh, next week. Mm-hmm. Um, my co-founder has like a big list of things she's posted on it. Um, I, I had. It's, it's really funny. Like I had all my stuff missing before we had the idea of Brinier's. Like I was. I forgot my skateboard back home. Um, I forgot all kinds of clothes, things like that, and I just like. I didn't have it, so I had to figure my way out in, in Bali. Uh, but like, yeah, my co-founder has some listings for some some makeup, some uh, some sports stuff as well, like uh, just some good sports gear you can't get here. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm actually though I've I've used it as a bringer. Uh, I was the first the first one to bring something uh, back to Bali on the visa run in Singapore. Uh, I brought some some British guys some marmite. I don't know if you know marmite. It's like this spread they put on their toes. It's is uh, that. The same thing the Australians eat, like that really. Vegemite. Oh, yeah. Vegemite. It's is called it? Marmite in okay. the UK. Uh, it's, I, I haven't tasted, but I've heard it's pretty bad if you're yeah. not used to it. But anyways, yeah, a British guy in Bali uh, wanted some of that, so I brought some of that back from Singapore. Um, and then, like, obviously, when I'm, I'm going back to Montreal and coming back uh, to Singapore afterwards, so I have a few more deliveries planned. Uh, so yeah, and just to kind of get to understand what it's like to yeah. go and buy something for someone, and like, what are the hard parts, and how can we make it smoother for uh, all our other users? Right. Uh, so yeah, I've been I've been the bringer. That's cool. It seems like you like learning, right? What? It, you just seem like you're one of these lifelong learners. You, yeah. you enjoy. I read that you just. Learned how to ride a motorcycle recently too. Is that right? Uh, I went last year in Vietnam. Actually, um, I was traveling across Southeast Asia. I did a few things, and I wanted to do something like a bit less touristy or, uh, I guess, more challenging. So I bought a motorcycle in Hanoi, um, and I learned to drive. And I drove down Vietnam on a wow. bike. Uh, yeah, that was that was something. That sounds amazing. Yeah. I I remember an episode of the show Top Gear. I don't know if you. Yeah, they do the yeah. high van pass. Yeah. 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 So it was sort of similar. Yeah, Did more uh, more dangerous most of the places. Um, like the, the pass they do there is really beautiful, but like there's so many tourists that go that they actually close off the road for the main trucks. Uh, but most of it was just going up mountains with like buses passing you super quick and yeah. dogs trying to bite you. Um, but it was yeah, it was so cool. I had a friend who went on a little motorcycle trip in Vietnam, and he is not the kind of guy that uh, he's not a liar. <laughs> he told me that when he got to his destination, wherever he was riding that day, when he pulled over, he claims there was a snake stuck in the back of his flip flop, <laughs> like it had bit his flip flop and gotten stuck. Which you know, so yeah. snakes, dogs, buses. Oh yeah, yeah, I, I can believe that. It's uh, yeah, it was a rough ride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so um, traveling in general, it's. I, I saw a lot of pictures of you in the mountains when I was looking into you know your background. Mountains, traveling, nature, are these kind of your things? Yeah, I, I love, uh, I, I really like the mountains. Uh, I'm glad to be in Chiang Mai because of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I like even before going to Southeast Asia, we traveled a lot with my family, like in North America. Yeah. Uh, I did a one month canoe camping trip when I was young. Um, Where was that? It, it was in Quebec. Cool. Uh, just in the north of Quebec. It was actually really cool because there was a forest fire the month before. So like for the first two weeks, uh, the whole forest was just burnt. So like black trees, oh, yeah. and orange, uh, yeah. like half burnt leaves on the ground. Kind of a Halloween feel to it. Right. Um, but anyways, yeah, I, yeah. And I guess the six month trip I did across Southeast Asia, New Zealand, Fiji. Um, I kind of thought it was going to be a one time thing. Like you know, this is like oh, taking a year off, doing this, whatever. Um, and then I just really, really liked kind of the vibe where you're in a country you don't understand everything about it and it really changes your like your habits the way you go about them you're not watching tv every night you're like yeah. going to eat some street food or whatever um yeah i and then we we think we kind of had this decision this <laughs> summer like okay let's just leave again and see what, what happens and like it seems like we were not going to be back for the next yeah at least till september and then probably after there uh, spend some more time in asia and we're looking at south america for bringers too so uh yeah it's 
like what I thought was going to be a one-off big trip seems to pretty become kind of a, a lifestyle. Right. Yeah. I think that happens to a lot of people. Yeah. I remember my dad one time told me that travel is not the cure for wanderlust. Yeah. It just makes it worse, right? Yeah. I guess some people phase out of it, but a lot of people I've met, that especially like here in Chiang Mai, I meet people and they said, yeah, I came here for a month and I've been here two years. Yeah. Or you know, I was thinking I was probably going to go back home last summer and I was going to come over for a few yeah. months, go home for the summer and then probably come back to Thailand. But I didn't. Yeah. I've been here over a year, you know. Um, yeah. I'm actually going to China in about a week um, to look in t- to meet the people at the factories that I've been emailing with about the Better Me board game. And uh, I was telling my mom, you know, yeah, I'm going to China in about a week. And she said, oh, really? But who's going with you? Nope, nobody, just me. Oh. And she kind of paused and she goes, man, I, and she's probably going to be listening to this. But she goes, I'd be scared to just go to some new country by myself like that, you know? And uh, I thought, you know, I didn't really know what to say because I guess, yeah, I guess I'm kind of scared, but I'm also kind of used to that feeling. Yeah. You know, I've done it before. It worked out fine. You know, you get the, the butterflies or whatever. Yeah. But, um, and she did a fair amount of traveling when she was young, too, all through um, places like South America. And, wow. um, they were trying to go to the Galapagos Islands. They didn't quite make it, her and a group of friends. But, you know, she got yelled at by guys with machine guns in Colombia and all kinds of stuff. But, um, yeah, I think um, the more you get outside your comfort zone, at least for me, the more you start to enjoy that feeling. Yeah. You know, it's that same feeling that some people might think is, like, anxiety or, or nerves. Yeah. It can be excitement. Yeah, and I, I really try to uh, I really try to, to fight it a lot. Like I, I used to be super scared of heights, like crazy. Um, and I went bungee jumping once, uh, and that that was probably the scariest thing. I, I thought I would, like I, I got there. I was like, oh, okay, no, I'm not jumping. I'm not gonna do it. And they they kind of told me I had to. So then I just jumped. And then, <laughs> they told you you had yeah, to. <laughs> like oh, we can't. Like you're tied up already. You, you have to go. Yeah. And then I I, I did and. Um, the feeling you get after that, which was like the big thing you didn't think you were able to, get, to yeah. do, uh, and you just do it, and then you're kind of on the other side of the bridge, like, oh, okay. Or like just the, for Christmas, we were in the Gillies in Thailand, and uh, I went free diving for the first time, oh, cool. um, which is kind of a scary one, too, which you just don't have any air. Yeah. Uh, so you're going down, and you're like, they, t- they tell you about uh, when your diaphragm starts pushing, it means you're halfway through your, your dive. Um, but it doesn't feel like it. It feels like you want to breathe and you're out of breath. So to just kind of keep on doing that and staying calm in this place where even like your body is, is panicking and gasping for air, um, I, I just love that feeling afterwards where you just like yeah. push yourself to, to do that. Yeah. Now I'm curious. So at what depth were you doing that? Um, I, didn't, I didn't go super deep. I had a problem with my ear. I went all the way down to 12 meters. Um, it's pretty far. Yeah, most people would get to like 15, like if you would get to 18 or 20 with two, a two-day course. Um, really? Wow. Yeah, so we, we, we would go to 10 meters a lot. We did a lot of like safety stuff at 10 meters. And then, uh, yeah, I went to 12 meters on my... my 12 biggest. meters, that's about 40 feet, is that right? Yeah. Um, most of, probably a lot of people listening are in the U.S. They yeah, have no idea what we're like talking about. 38 feet. I'm looking it up right now. 12 meters, 2 feet. So that's significant. Definitely. That was a, and you did that with having ear problems? Uh, I, I didn't know I had an ear problem. Like, I just got there and okay. they, uh, they kind of, like, I figured it out halfway yeah. through. Uh, it's just, it was a bit annoying because I'd have to stop at five meters. I don't know if you've already done, like, scuba diving. Um, um, in a pool. Yeah, you know, you're always, <laughs> e- well, you're always equalizing. Equalize, yeah. Um, but I had to, like, it's not a big deal if you're scuba diving to stop and equalize because you can breathe. Right. But if, like, you lose all your momentum and you yeah. have to stop at five meters and then convince yourself mentally to go down another five meters and then come back up, uh, yeah, that was, that was something. Yeah, it gets, you want to equalize very often. Right? Yeah. Because if you don't do it for too long, it gets harder to yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah, and then that's the thing. The first dive, I went too deep, and I like, kind of like pushed my ear in. So then for the next two days, it was always hard, and uh, it just took off. So does that make it harder to equalize, or does it just hurt more? Uh, I, I don't know if you could tell the difference. Like, okay. it, it was just hurting the whole time. Yeah. So, and right. then if you stay like if you stay at five meters, you kind of I would kind of get used to it, and then go a bit yeah. harder down, and it becomes less like the the pressure, the percentage of pressure you add becomes lower and lower as you go farther down uh so it's not as bad like it's the, it gets to hurt less yeah rather than more yeah right yeah. i've seen some youtube videos of the top people in the world at free diving oh, it's, and it's, it's crazy really amazing yeah. like our instructor had done 100 meters um wow which would be uh i mean most people don't scuba dive that deep yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> um on, on one breath and yeah that's just crazy 
man, I saw a really interesting, beautiful YouTube video of a guy. I, I don't. You, it was like he was base jumping underwater. He stood on the edge of one of those just those holes, you know, like those blue holes. I don't know where it was, but um, and I'm sure it was. There were edits in the video, so it might have been several different scenes stitched yeah. together. But he just he just dives like face first. Like he's jumping off a building in slow motion. Wow. It was like a slow motion version of wingsuit <laughs> jumping, you know? Yeah. And he just goes down and down and down. And even though it was probably several edited together, even each individual clip was super wow. impressive to me. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's another world, you know? Yeah. Like that's not where we're, we don't no, belong it's there. It's crazy, yeah. It's so amazing. And even, even just being able, I've never gone as deep as you've gone. I've messed around a little bit with, you know, more like trying to see how long I can hold my breath. Yeah. Not at real deep. Mm-hmm. depths but um it's it's really a fun mental challenge oh yeah holding your breath too uh yeah this is a really cool one i did um three laps underwater on this pool and of course i push off holding with my feet breath. each time yeah wow. so i don't know how actually nobody was timing it i was That's just going for long. distance you know how it's, it's, what, it's like a 25 meter pool uh, 75 feet i don't i maybe yeah it might be or yeah. or a little smaller than that okay yeah but um Actually, you know what? I pasted it off, and I forgot. I, I, I kind of measured it. But um, I did... I can do one length underwater, no problem. It's not wow. even really a challenge. I mean, I've always been a decent swimmer. But then I wanted to get two. Because I, I, I did one, no problem. So then I did about one and a half. And I was like, oh, I want to try to get two. Yeah. And then once I got two, I really want... You know, then I did about two and a half. And at this point, I had people there just in case I blacked out. <laughs> but... I was like, man, I think I can get three, which <laughs> at first I would have never thought I could get yeah. three, but you know, probably it was the same with you. Like, oh, yeah, oh I sure. did 12 meters and now, you know, now I want to do 15 or 18. Or, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember I had people watching and I did the three lengths and to be completely honest, I, I, I think I was starting to lose my vision. I came up like a foot or two short of the wall. Wow. And, uh, I remember I was like seeing stars and kind of dazed <laughs> and it's not a deep pool. So I could actually stand up. Yeah. But, uh, I, I was really close to going out. <laughs> Which, I don't wow. know, it was a fun challenge. Yeah. I like those, just overcoming obstacles. And then, you know, even though there's almost no point to doing that, that's probably what some people listening right now are thinking, what's the yeah. point? Well, other than training yourself how to overcome obstacles, you know, there's no practical application for that. No. You're probably not going to get stuck under ice where the hole is like <laughs> 300 feet away. But it's just learning your limits and learning that your limits are really just this idea you have yeah they're mostly mental uh, yeah until you black out then you reach right physical. that's a real <laughs> yeah. and you can alter those too yeah you know? yeah for sure train at altitude or do yeah. whatever you know get some kind of supplements and stuff but yeah. yeah that stuff's really interesting to me and i'm not like an extreme kind of guy as much as some people but yeah that's that's fun stuff um that's that's cool i can't believe your instructor went 100 meters down yeah, 100 meters is crazy um Man, I'll, go look for that video. I'm going to find it real quick. <laughs> Base, jump, underwater. I bet that'll get it. And then you guys need to go look this up. Yep, that got it. Base, jump, underwater. Uh, a French name. Do you know how to say this name? G-U-I-L-L-A-U-M-E. Guillaume. Guillaume Neary. Base jumping at Dean's Blue Hole. And I just found it by go Base, jump, underwater. You'll find it. It's a really cool video. Um, man, so what else? What, what other... Cha- okay. Say bringers is a huge success. Yeah. Uh, what's your life? What will it look like? You're going to keep traveling? You know, it's kind of hard because um, it's really hard to envision what I guess mm-hmm. bringers a big success would be. Like, um, like I mean, yeah, it's it's just at this moment we're so focused on trying to build the first version of yeah. it. Um, and to imagine how you'll feel about that five years from now, mm-hmm. uh, kind of like if you asked me one year ago, I probably would have answer that would be building bringers right now yeah right uh, in Chiang Mai or whatever um so I don't know I guess at the moment uh for the next next few years we'd love to be able to to build it into something like a lot of people use a lot of people yeah. know about um and that and that does allow us that like the, the opportunity to travel at the same time now that we do it fully remotely um but yeah we like to to be able I guess to live like obviously for a traveling company uh not to be stuck in an office in singapore to be able to kind of go around and uh just meet the people who, who are using it and travel ourselves uh so that would be that would be really good um i think it's 
like definitely the focus is on like can we build it and can we get it there and whatever it'll take for the next few years i think our team is, is really willing to take those challenges on um but if we can incorporate like traveling and just doing really cool things in it uh, that's obviously the goal for everyone yeah yeah okay i mean it sounds like what you're doing I mean, you like what you're doing, the lifestyle yeah. you're living. It's not like you're grinding it out in some Wall Street job to then go travel later. No, exactly. It's, it really fits, complements yeah. your lifestyle. Yeah, so we're just, like, really happy. Like, we're really grateful to be working on this and to be able yeah. to, to spend so much time just doing this and, to, like, have people say that it's, it's useful and that they, they believe in it. Uh, that, that's really been the coolest thing, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that... This is the way I see it. I think there are you know, different strokes for different folks and uh, whatever floats your boat and all that kind of stuff. But I think that life is too short to spend a bunch of time doing something you don't like just to be able to later do something you do like. And, and I'm not saying you shouldn't work or put in any effort or anything like that. You know, Don't take it yeah. that way. But if you can find – I mean it's like that old cliche about if you find a job you love to do, you'll never work another day. Yeah. You know. Um, I think that you really can find things you enjoy doing and you feel like you're contributing. Oh, for sure. And like we've, like we've, we've, we're working like 10, 14 hour days every yeah. day. Like it's not like we're, we're sitting on the beach or anything. Right. Um, but we're still, at the end of the day, when you check out, you're still in Thailand and that's what I enjoy to be able yeah. to like go out and eat whatever, like some little like, pad thai and to, to ride a motorcycle and things like that. Um, so to just have like the opportunity to work on something you're, you're interested in and then wherever you want from uh that that's really really good for us uh yeah. but again maybe it's not for everyone and yeah but i think if you're doing something you really like doing and you're in a setting where uh you enjoy yourself then that's that's the best you can hope for yeah and i think you're an example for people that are you know somebody listening right now is kind of stuck doing this something they're not totally enthusiastic about it is you're in the driver's seat you can yeah. make that switch if you want to yeah. and it's it's so hard every time like we got like after we, we we were pretty successful with the franchise. My my co-founder and I got some job offers at that company. So like you should coach some other people doing their franchise and like like we'll we'll have you'll have your office and like you'll you'll be in charge of this and like the pay is good everything. Um, and then like you say and say no to that or if you've taken that job to, to kind of leave from it, it's yeah it's of course it's hard and especially yeah. like the the pressure like the social pressure you have is hard because. You tell someone like, oh yeah, yeah, that, that good job offer I had, I'm not taking it. I'm going to like, Bali or to Thailand or whatever. Uh, it, it's it's like not the most yeah. uh, socially pleasing thing yeah. to say. Yeah, I had a, a friend who was she's from Texas and she now teaches. I think she's still in Thailand. I think she's going to Cambodia soon. Um, anyway, her she was getting that kind of feedback from her friends. She had some sort of a corporate job. She was doing pretty well, and she was thinking about just dropping it and going to figure something out in probably thailand yeah. you know and that was part of it is her plans are kind of vague and people are looking at her oh, like yeah. mm, it <laughs> seemed kind of crazy you're gonna throw away this career and um so i was trying to kind of help her through that because we were in contact because of couch surfing she was okay. asking me about at the time i was on Copenhagen, uh-huh. or maybe i was still in chiang mai either way she was asking questions about the area like you know can i are there atms can i use the de- all those kind of questions yeah. and um and then she started kind of telling me man i'm getting all this this kind of like wet blanket treatment from all my friends and family and everything. And I had to kind of help her uh, step back from that and go, look, you know, you're asking the wrong people because you're asking people that have never done it. When you get here, or even if you just get in like a Facebook group, like we were talking about, you know, find the Facebook group and wherever it is you're thinking about going and you'll be like, wow, there's all these other people (laughs) who gave away a a good job, you know, stable income or whatever. And they're doing the same thing I want to do, you know, find those people. And that's, that's really what we did. We went to Hubit in Bali, the co-working space. And that was kind of our plan. We're like, okay, we, we read some stuff online before leaving. Like a lot of digital nomads are there. People that run their businesses uh, from Bali, the rice field with monkeys and everything. Uh, So we're kind of like, okay, we're going to go there and kind of see how they do it. Um, and that was super helpful. That's where we got started with bringers. We got loads of feedback on the idea at first. And to, to kind of figure out, okay, where are the people that are doing what you want to do hanging out? Yeah. And just go there. And, you know, even if you can just, you know, you have a couple of weeks off, just, oh, sure. just make it a little trip like that. Yeah. And I know a guy who's moving back here in about a month. He came over to Chiang Mai for a few weeks or two weeks, something like that, to go to this drop shipping convention thing that was mm-hmm. going on in Chiang Mai. And... Uh, 
he was just hooked. I mean, he he did have to go back. He had some obligations and things, but he's coming back here soon. You know, he went back home for a few months, but he had opened his eyes. He saw, like, just like you said, the people working at the co-working space with the monkeys or the beach. Same. Like, we we went to New York the first time, uh, the first time for, like, a a big summit, big startup summit. We came back. We had some work to finish, and then we went again. We met all these startups, and I was really, really like, okay, like, if these people have done it, they're not... Like you're not crazy or you're not like superhuman, right. uh, we could probably do it too. And that was really like what hooked us, like yeah. seeing real people doing the stuff you'd like to be doing. Yeah. yeah, right, right. And you could even just strategically bring certain things like computer parts, and you know you're probably <laughs> going to meet other digital nomads when yeah. you get there, right? I really like that that angle. Um, is there anything you want to talk about that we haven't covered yet? I want to give you a chance. Um, um, not really. Like I mean, no. Yeah doing everything so far yeah i have a couple of questions yeah. specific stuff about bringers too yeah um i i saw that you have a guarantee so yeah. if anybody's you know well am i going to pay them up front you have escrow is that how yeah it works? basically how it works is say you're the requester you'll pay us and not your bringer so we'll keep the money in escrow until you confirm you've received your item uh so we hold the money the the whole way through and that's kind of one thing we're bringing that say like the like there's some Facebook groups or like people post on Facebook yeah. to ask for their friends and do things like that. Uh, but then you're always kind of PayPaling the money or if not, you're buying something, not right. sure if like you're going to get paid back for it. Somebody's taking yeah. a risk. So yeah. we're like, we're, we're uh, definitely like mitigating that risk. Um, and we're like, we're a team of three people. We're travelers too. We're, we're not UPS or FedEx. So if something happens in the process, uh, we expect people to have basic travel insurance, but we know they can be held to deal with. So we'll cover items uh, like within reasonable bounds. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we, our goal is really just to help people get the stuff that they want and not to have you think about, oh my God, am I going to be paid back at my destination? Or like uh, taking this huge risk for someone, is it really worth it? Uh, we really want to make people feel secure and uh, like, well, it's the three of us answering all the emails. Uh, so there's no like third party customer service you'll yeah. have to deal with or whatever. Um, and no phone wait either because we don't have phones. So it's just like, uh, you'll be writing me an email and I'll handle your situation. That's really something. I like that positive spin. Hey, you don't have to wait on the phone because yeah. we don't have phones. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's really the one thing like I love when I get just awesome customer service. Um, even like sometimes you just cancel yeah. with a company and they're still really great about right. it. And that's one thing like that's definitely one of our core values to just have everyone's experience be really good. Uh, yeah. I think that's super important. I've definitely been on, I've had experiences on both sides and yeah. it really builds loyalty. Oh yeah, for sure. And then you get like the really bad ones and then yeah. you just never want to do that again in your life. And since it's obviously like a risky thing we're offering to people, uh, we want to make them feel safe as yeah. best we can. Yeah. Were there any other objections that came up over and over? Um, we have an FAQ now. Yeah. Uh, one of the big ones was of course like drugs and illegal stuff. Yeah. Um, but one thing is our service is just for new items. So you can't ask me to bring like your tennis racket from back home that maybe you've lined with coke yeah. on the inside. Right. Uh, but if you do want a new tennis racket, then I'll go out and buy it. So I know I'm ah. carrying the racket from Walmart or I ordered your package off Amazon on my account. Um, yep. So the bringer has to purchase the item themselves. Okay. So then there's no risk on his side because it's just something he's buying. And if, if they're not comfortable, then there's other items they can choose from. So we'll never impose an item on you. Um, so that's that was one of the biggest ones at first. Um, and like we, that, that's just not part of our service. Uh, mm-hmm. So we just focus on new items, yeah. Does the requester always name a price or can they say make an offer, tell me what you want? Um, right now they're naming the price. Uh, since it's manual, if the bringer, like, if the bringer offers to do it for more, I'll email the requester, ask them what they think about it. Uh, for sure, as soon as our web app launch, you'll be you'll be able to modify the price. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and that that'll depend. Like say, oh maybe I'll meet you at the airport for twenty bucks, but then you bring it to my home for thirty yeah. or something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, and will you have you know like the eBay feedback type of system? Yeah, yeah, we're definitely gonna have comments uh, yeah. and ratings. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Couch surfing's the same yeah. way. It builds that trust. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Huh. And also, I wonder, will you do that? You know, if it gets like the lopsided karma type of thing, like okay, this person has brought a hundred things and they've only requested two, will there be? Will that be visible? That might be down the road. Um, yeah, probably down the road. Yeah. Um, one thing, like we want we want to do is definitely focus on the ratings and the, the comments. So that way, if you have a more expensive item, uh, you can go for the guy who's yes. brought a hundred things before. Um, and maybe that person can earn more, more, more money bringing things because he's built that trust. Oh yeah, exactly. Uh, so that's really the one thing we're looking for. Like how do you make your power users, uh, 
kind of gain value out of the totally. fact that they are and that's businesses. in your best interest too because then everybody will trust your company yeah exactly more. and kind of like on Amazon I'll pay two bucks more to get like the 97% yep. good rating two day shipping whatever whereas if it's two dollars off but it sounds a bit dodgy uh, I won't go for that one yeah yet. And, you know, I saw in the comments in the group we were talking about, some people were, you know, questioning, well, what if it doesn't get there? A, you guarantee it. And B, like in my deodorant example, even if the first time it disappeared and I had to do it twice, I'd still be paying less than I would with the Amazon shipping. I mean... (laughs) And we we would make you pay twice. And the thing is, that's cool, is we have the money in escrow. Uh, So in the worst of worst cases, that means we pay both parties. So say you request it, you never got it, but he says he's brought it. Uh, We'll just pay to both. And then obviously someone who repeats that behavior uh, will just ban them. Yeah. Uh, but like since we have the money in the middle, we're kind of mitigating risk for ourselves as well. Right. Uh, and the users, yeah. So, oh, the squirrel. You had a squirrel that lived with you? Yeah, in my apartment. Uh, yeah, it was... What was, was that? <laughs> yeah, I had an apartment this summer in Montreal, and it was funny because I, w- I was working like crazy 60, 70 hours a week, but my three roommates were really more on the... Uh, artsy side so I had like a filmmaker living with me uh-huh. and then two university girls who were kind of off on the summer so they'd just be always like doing like projects and things like that and one one evening I came back from work and they're like oh there was a squirrel that was sick in the road and we brought him back and like oh, we're, okay. yeah we're helping him out so he stayed there for like two weeks I saw a picture of the squirrel up right yeah. by your face. Yeah, it was really cool. He got really, really friendly. Wow. Uh, I guess because like he was almost dead and the girls really like made him healthy again. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I would just have breakfast and he'd be walking all over me and things like that. And then you let him go. Did he still hang around the neighborhood? Or? Oh, I didn't know that. I was working probably when they let him go. Yeah, yeah. So just came in one night, squirrel wasn't there anymore. I'll po- If it's okay with you, I'll post that picture yeah, so sure. people can see your squirrel friend. Yeah. I thought that was kind of interesting. Now, as, as far as this, just switching gears here, um, back to traveling. Where What were the highlights for you in your traveling? I mean, are there places you want to tell people about or um, travel I tips? I really, really love Vietnam. Mm-hmm. Um Thailand sometimes kind of feels like it's over touristy. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's still loads of great stuff you can do here. Um, I went on a farm for two weeks. I went meditating in Doi Sutep, and it's just a really nice place to kind of be passing through. Um, but Vietnam, I really like because it's like in this kind of middle place. It's not as uh, big as Thailand yet, but it's still pretty convenient. It's not like Laos where it's like there's dirt roads everywhere. Um, and you can buy a motorcycle for 300 bucks in Vietnam. That was a big selling point for me. Yeah. Food was so good. Um, I guess, I mean, it, it's really a personal thing for me. Uh, that's where I had probably the best times. Um, How do you compare the Vietnamese food to Thai? Vietnamese food was more like a, Thai. It's usually like you'll get one dish. You know, you get like a pad Thai. You'll get like chicken with like everything yeah. fried together in one pan. Vietnamese, you'll go to a restaurant and you'll say like, I want fish. And um, they, they bring like... Okay, one plate of fish and one plate of vegetable, one plate of rice, and then mm-hmm. like a little soup. So it's kind of more yeah. like a like four plates in front of you, different meals. Um, yeah, I found the same. I've only, literally only spent hours in Myanmar. Okay, but it was the same there. I I pointed at whatever I wanted. And then a whole bunch, I got, I yeah. think I counted and there were like nine plates. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. great. I remember, yeah, first day, I was just <laughs> like, oh my God, like, how am I going to eat on this? Yeah. Right. Uh, no, I love Vietnam, and um, I actually I, I spent some time te- doing some volunteer teaching in Vietnam, mm. and I got there thinking I was going to teach English, so like, hi, my name is Tim, I go to school, um, but I was teaching university level students about entrepreneurship. Oh wow! So I got down the first day, and like the volunteer boss or organizer was like, "Oh, you're teaching business." I was like, "Oh, do you have a curriculum or something?" He's like, "No, you told me you had the business before, uh, so you're teaching business Monday, Wednesday, Friday for two hours." Wow! Uh, and to kind of get and we talked a lot about entrepreneurship with the with the students and to kind of get to know like what were the projects they wanted to do and what were the problems they would like they thought they were going to have and do that I really got like a close connection with people my age and as in, in Vietnam and seeing like what they thought was going to be hard and what they thought uh, were, were problems with them and how they were similar or different from us. So that was that was really a great experience. Interesting. Now, were most of them, were they wanting to start local businesses or were some uh, of them thinking about selling overseas? Um, most of them wanted to either start something local, like say a, a guest house or a tour company or like a restaurant. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there were a lot of them who wanted to, they were disadvantaged students. So they were often from, uh, from small villages in Vietnam and they wanted to give back their so say like build a clinic yeah. in their village or like teach English like build a school in their village and one of the things they were really struggling with is like how are we going to get like I can't pay workers to like build a school or pay teachers 
and to kind of like that was one of the big things to make them realize that volunteers like me would come and work yeah. for free uh, happily uh, was a big eye opener for them. Yes, uh, and then just the fact that most of their problems were like the same as me, like oh, I don't have enough money to start a business, or like I, I, I'm too young, I don't have an ex experience, um, and. It was really cool to just be able to go over them with them like okay you don't have money like what can you do to to get money for your business and to to make it seem like it was like there were some solutions and things they could do uh so that was a, a great experience you know you mentioned it probably blew their mind but wait people will come from the other <laughs> side of the world to work for free for yeah. me i i've known people in thailand it's it still seems really strange to me, but it's more or less standard that volunteering, you actually pay to do it? Yeah, same. Uh, yeah. yeah, I paid in Thailand, I paid in, Viet, uh, in Laos. Vietnam, I think, was free or like almost nothing. Uh, yeah, so people come and pay. To- <laughs> yeah, I talked to some girls in Bangkok who had just gotten back from somewhere way up in the north, and they had paid to plant rice and build a <laughs> road with like picks and shovels. Wow. And I'm just thinking, those guys, it must be hard for them not to laugh. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah, so we're going to build a road. Yeah, there's some better volunteer organizations than yeah. other, I guess. But yeah, it was, uh, which, which ones have you used? What, what would you recommend? I, I used Workaway uh, to just find them. So yeah. they don't like, it's kind of a Craigslist for volunteer okay. organizations. Um, it's pretty bad, actually. Like, it's, like the UI, everything is really bad, but there's just nothing else right now. Yeah. Um, and, and how do you, so you use Workway to locate something you're interested in, and how did you check up on that opportunity, make sure it's everything's okay? I, I didn't, so just, uh, <laughs> I just show up there, and then some, like one of them just fell apart in the process, and I mean, you're just still traveling, so you take the next bus to wherever you're sure. heading, um, but all the other ones, like I did four of them, and three out of four were just really, really good, um, yeah, so I'd recommend it. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's uh the whole travel work, travel volunteering thing is pretty interesting. I, that's not something I've done. Okay. Um, I've done a couple little, you know, I like help walk dogs at the local yeah, shelter yeah. here, stuff like that. But n- I never went somewhere just for a volunteer. I found, opportunity. Like first, it, it, cut, it cuts your travel costs like crazy. Yeah. So like, you, like the most expensive things when you travel is like where you stay, yeah. where you like buses and planes. So you're not moving and you're like not paying for your hotel. So your two biggest expenses are cut. And you just, especially in a country like Thailand where there's so many tourists, that's really, unless you live here for a long time, it's really how you get to meet the local yeah. people and not like your tour guide who's giving you an elephant ride or something. Right. Um, so yeah, uh, like I, I worked on a farm near Chiang Mai who was owned by an ex-monk who just opened this farm after uh, leaving the temple. And to just be there for two and a half weeks and like living with his family and uh, learning like, how they live on a farm is quite an experience. Yeah, yeah, I'd imagine. Um, I've also talked to a lot of people who, like one example, if, if people are listening, looking for a way to begin traveling, a really great thing that a lot of people do, if you're willing to work hard, is in Australia, Yeah. the uh, agricultural jobs. Yeah, yeah. Um, New Zealand has that too, for, uh, and it's any job you want, so if you don't want to pick fruits. Oh, okay. the, the wages aren't as good in New Zealand, but like if you just want to be a server in a restaurant or whatever, uh, so not like pick oranges and things yeah. like that uh, you can do it in New Zealand too yeah do you know how long the visa is in New Zealand? Uh, one year in New Zealand and like wow. for most countries like for most of Europe and America you can extend it to two years okay yeah and are there guidelines certain jobs you can't can think, or can't have I, I actually took it I didn't use it um, but I think it's more like you can't work more than 25 hours per week or something oh, like that dang uh, right yeah so it's, it's, something, <laughs> it's a volunteer holiday or tourist yeah. volunteer working and something in Australia they have an age cap on that right do um, Do you know if there is one in New Zealand? I think it's like mid twenties or early thirties. Yeah, yeah. I think Australia, it's around thirty. Okay. You know, um, so I miss that. But, <laughs> but I've talked to a lot of people who, you know, if you don't have enough money saved up yeah, for yeah. accommodation, oh, yeah. things. and especially if you're going like Australia, the wages are pretty high. So if you're able to live cheap, um, yeah. Then one of my friends did that. She went to Australia for six months and paid for her six months in Southeast Asia yeah. after. Because then you're flying to Thailand, whatever, Laos, Myanmar, and it's so cheap there. Yep. So like a thousand bucks will get you by for a month. Uh, yeah. Right. I think minimum wage is around fifteen dollars US, or maybe even a little more yeah, yeah. In, in Australia. So it's pretty good, yeah. Yeah. So there's really, you know, what and this is another. You know, once you start meeting people who have done it, if you're talking to the right people, these opportunities just start yeah. to pop. There's so many different things you can do. Oh, yeah. For, and when, yeah, when you travel, you meet people who got by the craziest stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because back home, going to Australia means, you know, buying a $2,000 plane ticket, staying in a hotel for $100 a night, yeah. you know. 
You said something too about the most expensive hotel you stayed in in the last like six months was the one where you got you had bed bugs. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of ironic. Trip, yeah, my last weekend in uh, in Bangkok, I was in Bangkok for some crime last year. Um, That's the like, giant water fight. Everybody. Yeah, and I didn't know about it. Yeah, so I got to my hotel was right in the middle of it, so I couldn't get out without getting sprayed with water. Um, but anyways, it's like my last weekend in Asia, and I just wanted something nice to kind of spend the weekend there and like treat myself after four or five months of. Like yeah. sleeping in dorms um, and yeah I got bed bugs there <laughs> so, yeah. and they probably follow you home yeah I actually I met my parents in New York and they kind of realized it so uh, yeah dang yeah yeah something like that's got to happen once in a while when you're <laughs> traveling all over the place um, hey do you have a second to do a couple cards from better me yeah. That's kind of sure. a segment in the game. So I'll give the quick pitch. If you guys listening don't know what Better Me is, you can go to bettermegame.com. It's a personal development uh, board game. So there's really nothing else like it, kind of like bringers, <laughs> trying to fill something that hasn't been filled yet. So um, they're basically you go around a track like most board games, and you earn points by uh, answering questions, telling stories, or committing to take actions after the game. Okay. Um, and you have an accountability partner. So if you say that you're going to do something kind – um, you know, random act of kindness in the next seven days, you would have a partner who holds you accountable and they have your, your email or your Facebook or something to, to actually make sure you go through with it. So we've got five categories, and I'll let you pick. We've got mind, tangibles, body, heart, and people. What do you like? Mind. Mind, all right. Draw a random card here and find one that we can do without actually playing the game. What are you good at? How did you become skilled at this? Do you think you had a natural talent for it? Or did you have to work ju just as hard as anyone else? One point for drawing this card and sharing. I think um, I'm kind of good at working hard. It would be the one thing. I'm not, I don't have like any outstanding skills in anything. Like I'm not a great sales guy. I can't just like turn a no into a yes or <laughs> things like that. Um, I'm not like athletic in any spectacular way. Um, and I kind of always just like did projects that were really hard and demanded a lot of work and was like got somewhere with it because of that so uh, like bringers right now we're working every day same thing with the company I was the youngest one so to just kind of learn everything so I think yeah at, I guess there's two things I guess it's first like getting involved in that so like opting into these projects and then after that I just like most likely won't quit so uh, I do a few laps in my pool probably until I'm about to black out and to kind of see how much I can push um, and then usually like good things happen before you black out or, right yeah. yeah so I, I'd say that would be it yeah yeah good that's a good answer I like it uh, let's see I'll pull one from how about people Oh, and you can pull these cards at bettermegame.com, everybody. It's all free. I forgot to say that. You can print the game board itself. Wow. You can print the player sheets. And then the cards, there's a random generator online. So you can play for free. Oh, I'm going to cool. China in a week to get it actually manufactured. And okay. I'll be selling. I actually already am selling the box copy, but I'm going to get them manufactured in bulk. Um, so that, you know, and you can go buy the box version right now. But you can also play free f probably forever. We'll see. <laughs> um, mentors have a powerful impact on our lives. Who is a mentor to you and how? Is there an area, an area in your life where you could use a mentor now? If so, where might you find one? One point for sharing, uh, for drawing this card and sharing. All players are encouraged to share. Um, the first mentor, whenever I think about mentors, I always think of my high school football coach, um, Tim Yeomans. And just like seeing how far you can go before you black out, that's what he taught me, is that you can do things that are harder than you thought you could do. And he would consistently push us. Um, to the point where we're about to puke or we do puke or whatever. And uh, he was cool because he was hard on us and he would expect a lot of us. Mm -hmm. But then he'd be like patting you on the back and telling you you're great while he was doing it, you know. Um, so he was a really good role model for me when I was about 16 is when I met him okay. and uh, played for him for a couple of years. Um, is there an area in your life in, in which you could use a mentor now? I would think, actually, I could stand to get more tied into other people who have made and sold board games. I don't really, I'm not really in that world. So I probably do need to start putting the feelers out and doing what you did. Yeah, that know? is a pretty, uh, pretty niche industry. Yeah, you, you know, you don't run across those people every day. Um, there are some great groups online where you can start to meet those people, though. Okay. But I was actually thinking earlier today, it's funny this came up. Um, I just need to schedule, like, some Skype calls and get to really yeah. know some people. Yeah. So I don't feel like I'm crazy. You know? yeah, so I know somebody sure. who's done what I want to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to share on that one at all? 
Um, we have a, a mentor who's been tremendously helpful with Brainers called uh, Benoit. He was actually the organizer of Startup Weekend in Bali. Um, so he, uh, and that's where we, we first tech drove our idea. So we got there and throughout the weekend, he was super helpful. And then, um, and then after, after Startup Weekend, he kind of liked what we did. So he started meeting with us uh, weekly and just like out of his own free time. And he has a job and a family in Bali. So we really appreciate it. He'd, he'd take the time and every week, like whatever things were going, good or bad uh could just always be there to kind of believe in us and be like oh no, no, no you guys this is gonna work and um and before we left bali actually when we were running out of money he offered to invest in the company uh even before we had any idea whether we'd get an incubator we'd yeah. close another investor or whatever it was just like and he, what he basically told us was like even if Brynjers doesn't work I'm investing in you guys uh -huh. and I think you guys are going to make something really good um, so he's been extremely extremely helpful in the past few months yeah great you've really got a good support network going on the fact that you have a co-founder who's on the same page now two co-founders yeah for sure yeah. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing and that's one thing we learned doing the franchise where none of our friends outside the program were doing anything like as demanding like mm -hmm. everyone was 17 years old in school so yeah. like half of them maybe had jobs like in a retail store or in a coffee shop but no one really had their business or did anything like that um, and to see that you had these other hundred people who were who were part of our program who were kind of just like you and doing this crazy thing and making those sacrifices yeah. and just uh, yeah, pushing themselves, which is the most valuable thing. And that's really why, uh, like, we value it so much now. Like, with our co-founder, we wanted someone who would inspire us. With our, our mentors, we wanted to be part of JFDI because we want to meet the other startups, we want to, mm -hmm. like, understand what they do. And uh, to kind of get that, like, that insider network is, is just so helpful. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's fundamental in anything. I, yeah. A friend of mine got into real estate right about the time I was getting out of it. Okay. And he was asking me for advice, you know, what yeah. would you do if you were starting today? And the thing I told him is that the most important thing I could tell you is make yourself useful to and get around somebody who's successful. Yeah. You know, whether you're buying them coffee or going just along with them on presentations or showing buyers houses or whatever, just get in the mix, see how they work, you know, and they'll delegate things to you that they don't have time yeah. for. And he really took that advice to heart and it's accelerated his learning so much. Oh yeah. And I, I forget where I read that, but somewhere I read that you kind of need three people in your life. You need a mentor. So someone to learn from, you kind of need peers for your competition and you need a mentee for, uh, to kind of not give up and to not lose face in front of them. So if you uh, have someone who looks up to you, uh, then you're like, you look good, really yeah. bad if you give up. Um, we're not at that stage yet, but I think you can do you can do that a lot with your peer network. Uh, so if you just like if you just know a lot of people and tell them you're doing bringers, yep. then if the next time you see them, you have to tell them you quit bringers. Uh -huh. um, it's kind of a rough conversation to go. It'll make you think twice. Like, okay, do I really want to have that conversation? No, okay, I'll right. just keep going a little bit. Totally. Yeah. You know, you can use that in any way too. I, you're reminding me of the first time I just cold approach just went up and walked up and talked to some girl I didn't know and it was at the pool when I was about 15 or 16 I was with my friends we were all sitting in the hot tub and we pretty much were all staring at the same girl <laughs> over on the other side of the building you know of course it's inside it's in yeah. Washington state but she was standing over by the little kid pool and we we're all kind of looking at her and I just blurted out I'm gonna go talk to her <laughs> you know and the reason I said that was because I knew if I said that to yeah, you five of to. my friends I have to do it yeah. yeah and and I still use that same basic principle oh, yeah. you know you just put your goals out there yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and you want to be a little careful obviously you want to have people around you who um they won't piss all over your goals right yeah. oh that's crazy why are you even gonna do well you know you don't need yeah. all that you know keep your goals away from those people but the people that you respect that you want to look good in front of like you're saying it's yeah. super powerful and it's, it's crazy too like uh i remember one of my really good friends from uh, from montreal he uh, he wanted to start out as a tattoo artist and uh i remember the first time he started out he was a graphic designer before kind of making the transition yeah. and he was like he was okay like he obviously had was skilled like with with arts because uh, he was a graphic designer but you know just starting out and he kept telling everyone like okay like four years from now everyone's gonna know my style like i'll do like this like this and like that's what i'm gonna be and he would say that like he would basically his his room in his apartment was his tattoo studio and he'd sleep in the in the wardrobe to basically yeah. have a tattoo studio wow. and uh yeah now he's traveling all across europe and uh like the, the U.S. and things like that, and tattooing, and like in Montreal, he has a year waiting list, wow. like just a few years later, but it's great, like all the time I think of that, like he would just, 
like from the moment he started, he knew what his goal was, and he just like put it out there, uh, even though he was like so 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 far from it. Yeah. Um, Are any of your tattoos from him? Yeah, he did most of the stuff on my lower legs, uh, mm-hmm. and really when he was starting out. So uh, back when he would do like three for a hundred bucks or something yeah, like cool. that. Um, yeah. So uh, it was really crazy to have those conversations, and now to, to see, uh, yeah, where he's where he's gone. Yeah, I really like the story of, uh, and this is all. I don't remember where I heard it. Somebody told me the story of Derek Jeter, uh, who was another baseball. I like okay. baseball. So um, I never watch it, but I like the game. But Derek Jeter, he's, he's oh, man, what is it? It's uh, spring back there. I think he just retired. He's not playing this year. Okay. Um, but he's another Hall of Fame type of guy. Played shortstop for the Yankees. And <clears throat> when he was young, he always knew he wanted to play for the Yankees, not just professional baseball, not just yeah. Major League Baseball, but the Yankees. And so, you know, he had the posters and Yankee jerseys and, and you know, everybody knew it. Yeah. So, you know, and then when he got to the point that who knows how many people have been at this exact same point, he was a minor league shortstop and he was having trouble with his fielding. He was doing okay, but not, yeah, he not wasn't great. a shoo-in yeah. to be an all-star five years from now, right? But he just kept working, kept working, kept working. And like that Paul Graham, you know, don't die. Yeah. <laughs> and the story I heard was he took... I think of several weeks off of batting practice and focused only on fielding because that was his weak spot. Okay. And he just went after it, you know, just wow. bam, bam. I suppose it was like four or five hours a day of just fielding. And he went from a below average or average minor league shortstop to one of the very best major league shortstops wow. in the matter of, you know, a few years. Wow. So uh, to me, those kind of stories are super inspiring. When you see somebody who got to that level mm-hmm. and you know that they, they stumbled and had to work hard just like everybody else. Oh, yeah, for sure. This, another one is the story of Sylvester Stallone. Uh, okay. If you Google it, anybody listening, go and Google uh, Anthony Robbins, Sylvester Stallone, or Rocky story, something like that. It'll come up. Tony Robbins tells the story really well. And he got to the point where he, he sold his dog. I'm not going to ruin the whole story for you, but, I mean, he was pawning his wife's jewelry couldn't pay his heat bill so he was hanging out in the library you know i mean and this is this is rocky rambo you know i mean this guy's huge right but it wasn't always that way and <laughs> so yeah i think it's really valuable to know those backstories yeah yeah really yeah um i'm kind of winding down oh what's going on yeah yeah well let's just let's wrap it up we've been going okay. about an hour and a half here yeah, i well. really appreciate you coming on yeah, yeah and again it's bringers.co go check it out put put a request on there bring somebody <laughs> something uh it'll be a lot of fun and yeah thanks again for coming on well thank you so uh, much for look forward me. to getting to know you a little better while you're yeah, still in, sure. in chiang mai so best of luck with everything thanks everybody remember we're on youtube we're on itunes we're on stitcher uh share us with your friends go give us a review that helps us out a lot i really appreciate you being here and stay tuned for the next episode take care everybody thank you